This is a 2011 Dodge Durango Citadel. Earlier this year, it was taken to a shop for new tires and an alignment when they found this problem. The power steering rack was leaking from one of its end seals and starting to fill up the steering rack boot. It hadn't yet escalated to the point of leaking onto the floor, so it hadn't been noticed previously. Unfortunately, it's not an easy seal to replace, and the only way to do it is to disassemble pretty much the entire steering rack. I wasn't even able to find a part number for the seal, so you would have to take it apart to even find that out. The shop quoted a price for parts and labor of replacing that steering rack of $1,650. That price seemed a bit excessive to me until I looked up the procedure involved. Then I realized that that quote was actually very good and most people online are mentioning prices in the $2,400 range. In my researching for this job, I was able to find that Jeep Grand Cherokees have a technical service bulletin for this exact failure. That generation of Jeep Grand Cherokee is built on the same platform and is very similar to this Durango, but I wasn't able to find an equivalent service bulletin for the Dodge version. I kind of wanted to take the rack apart and try to replace just the seal, but in the interest of time, since I couldn't even find a part number for it, I decided to just get a remanufactured unit. There were several different part numbers for these, and I couldn't figure out exactly what the differences were, but I was able to get this Mopar remanufactured part sold on eBay for a good price. This carries the part number mentioned in that Grand Cherokee service bulletin as the fix for the problem. So if they did actually make a change to correct the problem, this steering rack should have it. And that's a good thing because this Durango has been extremely well taken care of and doesn't even have 25,000 miles on the clock, so the fact that the steering rack has already failed, well, it doesn't exactly inspire confidence. It was a little bit of a gamble to get a part number listed as fitting the Grand Cherokee but not the Durango, but since the models are so similar and it was a good price for the part, I figured it was worth a try. I couldn't find a whole lot of information about these vehicles or this specific job on them online, which is why I figured it would be a good thing to make a video of. The few tidbits I was able to find were about the V6 or the two-wheel drive models, but this is a V8 all-wheel drive. The few things I could find about the job were people speaking in hushed whispers about how complicated it was. I also wasn't able to find any torque specs online, so in the interest of best practices, I went ahead and purchased a digital copy of the factory service manual. This describes the job in intimate detail, and it has you removing an incredible amount of parts from the engine bay. With the right equipment and expertise, I guess I can see why they tell you to do it this way, but it sure seems complicated. To describe the process briefly, Dodge would have you remove the outer tie rod ends, intake manifold, oil control solenoid, front skid plate, front brake calipers, motor mounts, separating the power steering lines, upper ball joints, front drive shaft, dropping the entire engine cradle out from underneath the supported engine, and then finally removing the steering rack. That same manual also lists different torque specs for parts on different pages, so I was hoping it was wrong about this job too. To my eyes, it looked like you would only have to remove the front differential to make enough room. The only way to find out for sure is to start taking things out until there's enough out of the way that we can remove the steering rack. We do have to remove the front differential, so the first thing we need to do is put the car into neutral. The car is a push button start, and I couldn't actually figure out how to do this without putting the car in run. It's not the easiest thing in the whole world to figure out, but the owner's manual did have the process. First, we need to get the car into accessory mode by not pressing on the brake and tapping on the start button. Then we can press it one more time to get the system into run. Now we need to put a foot on the brake, shift the transmission into neutral, and hold down the neutral button for the transfer case range select. The light will blink a few times, then turn solid red. Next, we'll put the transmission back into park, remove pressure from the brake pedal, and tap the ignition button to turn the car back off. Now that the car is off, in order to shift it back to neutral, you need to remove the lower lining from the cup holders in the center console, pop out this dust cover, and push down on this little hidden lever to finally get the transmission into neutral. With that done, and the parking brake applied, we'll lift up the front of the vehicle, set it down on jack stands, and remove the front right wheel. With that out of the way, we can take a pretty good look at the steering rack. It's pretty obvious where it's been leaking. After the shop looked at it, the car was driven for two more weeks before this repair was performed, and in that time, it did start to lose a lot of power steering fluid. 
It still wasn't showing much on the ground, but it emptied half the reservoir in just two days. The first thing that definitely needs to be out of the way is the steel front skid plate. We'll use the impact gun to remove the four bolts holding it to the body. And with them removed, we can set it aside. I do have to wonder why they used a steel skid plate, but a plastic oil pan. I'm sure that plastic oil pan saves some weight, but if they're putting that big chunk of steel below it to protect it, I wonder how meaningful that is. Moving on, we'll need to empty out the differential so that while removing it, we don't dump fluid all over the floor, and we'll take the normal steps to do so, including loosening the fill plug first to make sure we can get it out when we need to. Then we can remove the drain plug and drain out all of the oil. With that empty, we'll tighten the drain plug back down to 26 foot-pounds. Next, we can remove the vent tube from the differential housing to avoid damaging it during removal. This is simply on a barb fitting and can be removed by hand. And now for the first big hurdle of this process, which really shouldn't have been any kind of hurdle at all. All we need to do is remove these six bolts and separate the front drive shaft from the front differential. Going by the manual, we'll mark both sides of the flange so that they can go back together in the same orientation. We were able to get decent access to these hex head bolts using a wobble extension and the impact gun. The bolts are loctited in, and each pair of two has one of these plates to spread out the clamping forces. Since everything's in neutral, we can rotate the drive shaft by hand and get out all six bolts. And you would think that the majority of the process was done there, but not for me it wasn't. All we have to do is pop the drive shaft out of the differential input shaft flange. But of course, the manufacturer left no provisions for prying or hammering or really doing anything to help us get it out of there, and the parts are rusted together. I have admittedly never really dealt with this kind of flange before and was a bit baffled about how to separate it. I tried as much prying as I could possibly do, but it just wasn't getting anywhere. In the end, I just had to resort to using chisels and punches diagonally against the flange to painstakingly hammer it loose. I would chisel it in one location, turn the drive shaft about a third of a rotation, hit it again, turn it again, hit it again, turn it again, hit it again, turn it again, hit it again, until finally it was moving. And once it started moving, it wasn't too long before it popped free. Unfortunately, the outside edge of that flange is definitely a bit worse for wear. I'm really not sure how else to get it out of there, and at least no important surfaces were damaged, but it's still not a fun process. Also, remember that this vehicle is in really good condition. I can only imagine how hard this would be on a rustier, older vehicle. Anyway, that's separated, and next we have to remove both CV axles from the differential. We'll start by removing the axle nuts. We removed the driver's side wheel, and we'll start there by cleaning the threads up a bit with a wire brush and WD-40. I'm not actually sure what size these are, since the 32mm socket fit a little bit loosely, but it was close enough to use the impact gun to remove the nut. Then we can use a wooden board to protect the threads and hammer the CV axle out of the hub. And we'll repeat the same process on the passenger side. Before we touch any steering components, we need to make sure the steering wheel is locked in place so that it doesn't lose its center. If it's free to rotate while we're working, it could lead to a broken clock spring and all sorts of issues. It's not the sturdiest in the world, but a ratchet strap to the seat will be good enough to do the job. Next, we'll separate the tie rod ends from the steering knuckles. We'll loosen up the lock nut and install a two-jaw puller. Tightening that down quickly breaks the tie rod loose from the knuckle. Then we'll carefully tap the stud the rest of the way out and fully separate it and we'll repeat that same process on the other side. In order to make enough room to remove the CV axles, we'll also have to separate the upper ball joints. We'll disconnect those in the same way, first by loosening the nut, then by installing the two-jaw puller, and breaking the tapered stud loose. Because the brake hose and the wheel speed sensor wire are still in place, we'll support the steering knuckle with a bungee cord to keep pressure off of them. Unfortunately though, because nothing can ever be easy, the CV axle was just barely long enough that I was not able to remove it from the knuckle as it sat. And once it was clear that that wasn't happening, we went to the inner end of the CV axle with two pry bars and separated it from the differential. By using the two pry bars leveraged against each other, we were able to pop it out fairly easily. Unfortunately, I then realized that the inner end was long enough that it still wasn't possible to remove the axle from the vehicle. 
I wasn't able to get much movement out of that lower control arm, so in order to get a little bit more wiggle room, I also disconnected that lower sway bar end link. Unfortunately, that didn't seem to help much at all. I rigged something up to pull down pretty hard on the steering knuckle, but it just wasn't enough. It was close enough that it might have worked if the inner end was still in the differential, but for now, we're just going to go back to the driver's side and see if we have any more luck there. We'll separate the steering knuckle from the upper ball joint in the same way as the other side, though it was a bit more stubborn and we did have to hold the stud in place to remove the nut. Then we'll once again use a pair of pry bars to separate the inner end of the CV axle from the differential. For now, we're just going to leave that hanging there. I figured we would just start removing the differential, and once that had moved a little bit, maybe it would be easier to get the axles out. Next, we'll remove these two long bolts. These hold this vibration dampener to the frame, which is just a block of iron, and I'm not entirely sure what it does, but I guess it must do something. We'll set that aside for now and support the differential with a floor jack. There are just three bolts in a triangular pattern that hold the differential housing in the front subframe. The two towards the driver's side have weld nuts, but this one on the passenger side has a nut on the other end, so we'll have to hold it in place as we loosen it. With all the bolts out, the differential is free to move around. But, well, because of the awkward way it's installed, it can't move around all that much. We'll leave it just like that for now, and I'll have to admit defeat and remove the passenger side brake caliper. I was trying to avoid this mostly because I don't have the right tool. Despite owning quite a few hex key sockets, this uses an 11mm, which of course is one I don't have. But it turns out a 7 16ths was close enough, even if it was a very tight fit. So by hammering in the socket, we were able to remove the caliper's two slide pins. We'll also unclip the speed sensor wire from the brake hose, but we'll leave that wire connected because it seems like it'll be plenty long enough. Then we can remove the big spring clip from the outer edge of the caliper, set aside the brake pads, and use a steel hook to hang the whole thing off of the strut. That's one less thing to worry about when we're trying to maneuver the CV axle out, but in order to get it out, we first need to click it back into place in the differential. We'll tap that back into place using a large punch at the end of the CV axle. And with that fully installed, I was able to go back to my Wiley Coyote hijinks to remove the CV axle. It was still a fight to get it separated, but with a block of wood and the pry bar, we were able to make it happen. And with the outer end of the axle finally freed, we were once again able to separate the inner end from the differential. While it doesn't fit through the lower end of the strut so we couldn't fully remove it, we were able to pull it out of the way. You can see how far that inner end extends into the differential and what made it so difficult to remove. Now we were able to get back to the differential and started prying it and wiggling it out of place. We still can't fully remove it, but this position gave us enough wiggle room to separate the driver's side CV axle from it. Just like the passenger side, we're not going to actually remove the CV axle, we'll just support it and make sure it stays out of the way. And that's the last of the connections to the differential. It is now totally disconnected, and we just have to finagle it out of the engine cradle. The trick was tipping it down on the forward side, kind of sliding it away from the drive shaft, and then just manhandling it until it falls on the floor. It's certainly not the most graceful part maneuvering, but it also could have been a lot worse. We'll set that aside and keep those open ports covered, while we finally get to actually removing the steering rack. Our replacement rack does not have new outer tie rod ends, so we'll be reusing the factory ones. There's every chance that the alignment will not be the same with the other steering rack, but we'll mark everything and count the number of turns so that we can match it up and hopefully be close. With the outer tie rod end dropped back into the steering knuckle to help hold it still, we'll get to loosening the jam nut. Even though the fastener is pretty tight, a length of pipe over the handle of the wrench will make all the difference. With it broken loose, we'll spin off the outer tie rod end and count the number of turns. It was 18 for the passenger side, and when we went and repeated that same process on the driver's side of the vehicle, it was 23 turns. We're almost to the point where the steering rack can be removed. Well, hopefully. Next, we'll separate the intermediate steering shaft from the steering rack input. This is held on with a single pinch bolt. After removing the bolt, we'll give that a few taps to separate it. Luckily, we can just collapse the intermediate steering shaft a little bit and set it aside. That was definitely the easiest steering shaft I've ever had to separate. 
Of course, we'll also have to separate the two fluid hard lines going into the steering rack. We'll break loose that first flare nut, and keep pressure on the line as we loosen it to keep the fluid in until the last second. With some shop towels at the ready, we'll quickly pop the line out of the steering rack and put a plug over it. This is just a regular vacuum cap that should keep us from losing the fluid in the lines because I was too lazy to empty the reservoir. So we'll continue along, trying to spill as little as possible, and break the other line loose. Then we'll cap it off, and the only thing left holding the steering rack on the vehicle are the two mounting bolts. These large bolts pass through the subframe and have a nut on the top side. Getting to the top side is pretty awkward, but by reaching through the hole in the splash guard we managed to get a wrench on there. Thanks to the impact gun, pretty quickly we had both of them removed. At this point, the steering rack is entirely separated and we just need to find a way to get it out of there. What was able to work without a huge amount of drama was sliding the rack towards the passenger side, lowering the driver's side through the center, and then pulling the passenger side down too. Luckily, and kind of amazingly, that actually worked. They definitely crammed all of these parts into that engine bay, and it wasn't the way that the manufacturer described, but we found a way to get this out. Thankfully, we didn't have to touch the engine and avoided removing the entire engine cradle. Really, all we removed was the differential, and all things considered, it wasn't that difficult. Some steps definitely could have been easier, but for a first try at this procedure, I don't think it went too bad. At this point, I was just elated to finally have the old rack and pinion assembly on the floor. But, of course, we're not quite done yet. <laughs> 